Hello, and welcome to our speech, Future in Space, where we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of moving humanity into the solar system to work, play, and ultimately to live. Our species is at an inflection point in our civilization where we now have the ability to sustain life off planet in low Earth orbit and soon throughout the solar system. This is happening for several reasons. The falling cost of launch, the exponential growth of computation, the rapid commercialization of space, and a growing concern that humans are outstripping our planet's resources. Do we merely survive or do we expand outwards and thrive? And not just for a few dozen pioneers or even a thousand person city, but a future where there are more people living off planet than here on earth, a permanent spacefaring civilization. I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Greenblatt, the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly Corporation. And I'm here with my co-host, Eric Ward, who is the Vice President of Engineering Design. How are you doing, Eric? Oh, I'm doing very well. I'm looking forward to this conversation. We have Professor Daniel Britt from the University of Central Florida with us, uh, where he's the uh, Pegasus Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Sciences. He has served on the science team of four NASA missions and currently does research on the physical properties and mineralogy of asteroids, comets, the moon, and Mars. His honors include six NASA Achievement Awards, election as a fellow of the Meteoritical Society, and he has an asteroid named after him, 4395 Dan Britt. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you on. It's great to be here. So I was wondering, you know, about asteroids and what got that into you. You have an asteroid uh, named after you. And if I recall correctly, you, you used to be an economist. So how did you get into asteroids and, uh, and where is your interest uh, lie there? Well, I had an early midlife crisis and got bored with economics and mm -hmm. cast around for what I thought was something interesting to do with the remainder of my life uh, since I was still under 30. And one of the things that occurred to me was exploring the solar system. So I, uh, I went back to school and got the credentials necessary to get into the planetary science game. Excellent. So, wow, that it's, I think you were saying before our broadcast that uh, many of us have come to uh, the space exploration, commercial space development field from, from somewhere else. And so I guess your story isn't that unusual among our peers. Um, but, but you've made a name for yourself now in uh, space mineralogy, geology. I'm not quite sure what you call it. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you do now and what you're doing uh, at the University of Central Florida. Well, I, I run an organ a NASA-funded organization called the Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Science. And this is really an international group uh, consortium of scientists that do a lot of different um, uh, research directions. The unifying theme is looking at exploring the surfaces of airless bodies. So how do you interact with an asteroid or with the lunar surface? How do you uh, plan your exploration? What, the, what are these things made of? What are the, um, what are the uses of those materials? Uh, what are the hazards? Um, many, many aspects of the whole exploration game. Mm -hmm. And is this simply for scientific understanding or is there sort of a more of a commercial development thrust? Um, well, as well. Yeah, what I, I'm a scientist. I'm at a state university. So what I do is science. What I have observed is there are a lot of startups like yours that are in the exploration game. But although they're strong in engineering, they're, they can't afford a science team. So what I try to do is reach out to folks like you and say, you know, here's the best science in the world. How can we help you explore smarter, mm -hmm. explore safer and explore cheaper? And that's something that NASA is very interested in uh, catalyzing in the private sector. Yeah, no, it's extremely valuable. Um, because so as, as a commercial entity, we need to know where the lowest hanging fruit are, so to speak, if we're going to go out yeah. and start 
um, uh, commencing commercial operations, you know, whether it's it's just sending robotic uh, uh, probes or prospecting or establishing a, uh, a human settlement, taking tourists to asteroids one day, perhaps, um, or extracting yeah, and, the resources. And there are a lot of things that um, would not be obvious to to non-specialists that that are kind of second nature to us. And I such can, as. I, well, years ago, I worked with uh, engineers at Lockheed Martin mm -hmm. working on the camera for the Mars Pathfinder lander. And the first design was full of these big exposed gears. And I said to the engineer, uh, wouldn't the dust get stuck in the gears? And he looked at me and said, is Mars dusty? <laughs> and the answer was, well, yes go back, mm -hmm. cover the gears, because mm -hmm. Mars is very dusty. And, uh, you know, this is a, a sort of constant thing. Um, I, I may, as, as Jeff knows, I make simulants for the regolith of these, of these asteroids and moon and Mars. I actually have and, some right here yeah. in my office. I was yeah. given given it uh, yeah. at the ISRU roundtable a few years ago. So okay, yeah, can can you hold that up again, Eric? UCF right there. So okay, right. very good. Um, the uh, uh, I have people all the time who say I want to I want to do uh, resource extraction on the moon. So send me some lunar simulant, and I'll say, well, there's two basic what geologists call lithologies rock types on the moon which one do you want to work on and they'll say oh i don't know said, well go out tonight look at the full moon you can <laughs> see there's dark stuff and light stuff it's fundamentally different stuff <laughs> just tell me dark stuff or light stuff <laughs> and what we do is we consult with people and help them narrow down their their requirements on, on what they're really interested in. Mm -hmm. And so people who are interested in doing resource extraction at the South Pole need the light stuff, mm -hmm. because there's only light stuff at the South Pole. People who right. want to go to the Lunar Mari need the dark stuff. So, so a lot of us, uh, you know, looking at uh, the moon, let's just use that as an example. We are really excited about the water and other volatiles that are likely present, you know, in the permanently shadowed regions of particularly the South Pole, yeah. but also the North Pole, as I understand it. Uh, and so great, we're going to be extracting water, maybe we're going to be extracting some hydrocarbons, some other frozen gases. Um, but we're probably going to need more than just uh, these, these, these uh, gases and liquids to make a, a sustainable uh, human presence there. So what else can we, I, I mean, I'm kind of getting into a larger topic of the mineralogy of the moon and what kinds of things we can easily extract, but maybe just as a launching off point. Sure. So we're talking about the light stuff, uh, which the technical term for which is lowland. Uh, lowland or, uh, or mare. Mare. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the, the two units are highlands and mare. Okay. And Mari is at a lower level than the highlands, but um, people tend to call it Mari. And originally because it was thought that they were seas, right? When the uh, right. uh, scientists of a few centuries ago would look up at the moon. Yeah, but sure. We know you that know, there's when, no, no water, <laughs> no flowing water on the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when all you have is a, uh, uh, a relatively small telescope, mm -hmm. that, was, that was not a terrible conclusion at the time but now we know better. Right. So what's what's the mineralogy of that? You know, I think you mentioned uh, when we were talking earlier, there are over 5,000 minerals on Earth versus, you know, what's 200, 200 or so on, on the moon and Mars and even less on asteroid. Like, what is that? Well, there's, 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 there's a few more on. What happens is that planets are big geochemical experiments. Mm -hmm. And the chemistry of the planet essentially allows greater variety and basically evolution of, of minerals. And as the chemistry changes and planets with life, this is the one we know about, life profoundly changes the chemistry and the, as the chemistry changes, so change 
the, uh, the minerals. So there's a huge profusion of minerals on Earth that just don't exist on, on the moon or asteroids. And so and when the moon you say, has a relatively simple mineralogy. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, as a chemist myself, that's part of my training. You know, I tend to think in terms of chemical abundances and, you know, there's there might be a mineral like or an element like copper that exists in different forms. Sure. But ultimately, it's still copper. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no transmutations happening here. And so in one form or another, you should still be able to get at the at the minerals given enough energy and, you know, mechanical right. things. But I think what you're saying is something else is happening, too, where things get relatively concentrated or you might have loss processes with it. Yeah. Allow other elements to sink to the center of the earth and therefore be lost, right? Maybe you can. Well, the, the, that's part that. of this is that remember we're living on a world that has active tectonics. You go to the Pacific coast, you see volcanoes. So there's a, there's a, a huge heat um, generating system in the core that works its way to the surface and we have continents that move around and collide and that energy input from the cooling core really drives a lot of active mm -hmm. uh, chemistry. As you know, as a chemist, if things are really cold, you don't get much chemistry. It takes a long time to react and sometimes the reaction times are longer than the age of the universe. So right. you have to be very patient when it's cold. What happened mm -hmm. with the moon is it cooled off relatively fast. So it never had the chance to go through and have these mm -hmm. planet-wide uh, cycles of essentially processing and concentration. And that's how we end up with ores and concentrations economically mm -hmm. viable concentrations of stuff on the surface of the earth is that the earth has been going through and making this stuff for us yeah and that's a long process um and you get less of that on the moon mm -hmm. yeah and i suppose even less on an asteroid yeah. where you haven't had that thermal reaction at all so you mentioned well it more. depends on the asteroid though okay mm. yeah and the, it's more of the story yeah. So you mentioned ores, and um, I, I know that word has a has a more loaded definition than just, you know, oh, it's a rock or something. Oh. Um, and, and if I recall, you know, it, it's driven a lot by economics and technology rather than the mineralogy. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate it, on that a little bit? Well, it's an entirely economic term. Mm -hmm. An ore is simply something that can be extracted at a profit. Yeah. If it, you can't make money, then it's not an ore. So that means the definition changes over time, right? Sure. As technology changes and economics. As technology changes, yeah. as as relative scarcity changes. Mm -hmm. So you can, um, what they do for rare earth elements is essentially you put essentially whole mountains in blenders and extract small percentages of them. Hmm. And right. what really drives, whether it's an ore or not, are the environmental um, regulations that are imposed upon the miners. Mm. So for instance, there are lots of rare earth elements in the United States. It's just that um, the United States doesn't allow you to kill your neighbors with your mind. <laughs> Probably a good thing. <laughs> Which I think is a good thing, but there are other yeah. countries where they're just not so picky. Mm -hmm. right. And so a lot of the rare earths get mined in those countries where the people you know, downstream, suffer the consequences, what economists call externalities, the unintended costs and consequences of the action. So you're bringing up a really interesting point here I'd like to pounce on, which is, you know, it has been claimed by more than one individual uh, over the years that we should be moving our heavy industry off planet because we can move those externalities into a place where there are no humans and no other species to damage and we can essentially do the mining that we need to do to provide our technological civilization with materials without damaging the ecosystem around it do you 
Do you agree with that statement? Can you foresee a time well, when that might be possible? Or oh, I yeah, can, I, can, I, that? I would agree that you can you can do that. I can perceive a time when that would be a good idea. The externalities never go away. You just get different externalities. Uh -huh. And remember, if you're out there in space, it's not like there's going to be water washing them away or wind blowing away your your exhaust. You're going to have to fi figure out how to deal with that. And so there will right. be pro the the problems will be different, but there will still be problems. It won't be the same kinds. It won't yeah. be worried about killing your neighbors from toxic pollution, but you still have to make sure that you're you can uh, say operate a spacecraft without it getting hit by high velocity uh, asteroid Ejectum. debris, let's mm -hmm. say, or mm -hmm. that your waste product doesn't create high velocity ejected debris yeah. that hits somebody else's right. spacecraft and that somebody else might be a sovereign country which has both the means and the and the inclination to do something about you right right so um so what yeah what i mean kind of, go ahead eric i'll just say like yeah. you know what kind of minerals are we looking for on the moon mars and in asteroids that we think might be you know ore bearing in, in the future well the 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 low-hanging fruit really is anything that provides uh fuel and volatiles mm -hmm. so oxygen hydrogen so water for instance Right. are are basic things and what most people don't realize is that the average rock that you hold in your hand is almost by weight half oxygen hmm. uh, your right. problem of course is that the oxygen is locked into the crystal structure of that rock and you have to to break it out and that requires a fair amount of energy mm -hmm. but that's one of the things that that would work on the the moon just fine as long as you can get the energy is that the 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 literal surface regolith the surface material is is 45 percent oxygen and when you when you extract when you liberate that oxygen you also get for the most part reduced metals that sure. have a value in their own right right, right. essentially what you're doing is you're you're taking a crystal structure that has a mixture of metal on one hand and, and, and oxygen and silicon on the other, well, silicon and, and metal and then oxygen on the other hand, and you're breaking that apart. And so you get a, a mixture of silicon and metal on one side and oxygen on the other, and, and you can do stuff with that. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. I, do you think that getting metals from space, for instance, is going to be essential to building a you know, a sustainable space economy. Oh, sure. And if you get into asteroids, you do have asteroids that are almost totally metal. Mm -hmm. um, because you've got, these are essentially fragments of the cores of asteroids that have completely melted and created a core mantle and crust the way the Earth has a core mantle mm -hmm. and crust, except that you've broken this apart and exposed the core. So what's good about that, about being going straight to the core? Of well, uh, that, that's a great way to find iron because these things are gonna be somewhere between 85 and 95% iron, mm -hmm. big chunk of nickel, and then basically all the, the iron loving elements that you see in the periodic table, all these things that will concentrate in cores. I'm going to bring up a uh, an image. Actually, I, I was thinking about slide six from your deck. Is that appropriate? Sure. Yeah. All right. So basically, yeah, so. everything you see in the purple and yellow. Uh, the yellow are so-called calcophile elements. That is, that they like like to bind with sulfur. And the uh, the purple are the siderophile elements. They like to bind with iron. And things like platinum group elements are are very much uh, siderophile. So you know, uh, uh, for platinum. people who can't see, we're looking at a periodic table, and the platinum group elements are kind of right in the 
Yeah. Um, right hand side of the purple elements. So yeah, um, it's 44 yeah. through 46 and so on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So what you see in iron meteorites, which are samples of the, this type of asteroid, are relative enrichments in things like iron, um, well, huge enrichments in iron and nickel, but of course, relative enrichments in all these siderophile mm -hmm. elements, including gold or platinum, uh, silver, mm -hmm. uh, lead, gallium, germanium. You make you make stuff out of these things. I was going to say they're all pretty important for uh, both technology as well as economics, right? Some of them are That's valuable right. in their own right, like gold, but they're also used in electronics and many other applications. Oh yeah, but you know it's not a bonanza. There, there are no concentration processes on top of this core formation, so you'll never find solid gold or solid platinum asteroids. Right. What you'll find are the these elements in concentrations that would be, you know, ore grade on Earth, except these concentrations would be like parts per million. So platinum is typically five to ten parts per million. So mm -hmm. if you're on Earth, um, ten parts per million is a pretty good ore grade for platinum. But that means you have to mine a ton of rock in order to get 10 grams of platinum. Mm -hmm. Right. And people are happy to do that. That's what you do in the major platinum provinces uh, on Earth, where, mm -hmm. you, where most of the... There's another slide that I have that uh, you don't need to put up, but the major platinum resource on Earth is called the Marinsky Reef in South Africa. And it's a vein of, of platinum bearing ores that are about yay big. Roughly Hold like your fingers up 10 there, centimeters. Like, yeah. In about, you know, five or 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And getting that out is not trivial, but that's 70% of the world's platinum. Wow. Yeah, and, and the and concentration of that is relative to the crustal abundance of platinum is two thousand times. Hmm. Wow! So what happens now, in in asteroids is you've already gone through that concentration process. Yeah, so that makes it very lucrative then, although you still have the economics of having to develop mining equipment that can operate at very low G levels, sure. fly several years to the asteroid of interest mine it probably robotically and then send the, the finished products back, right? If you're going to use them here. Sure. But remember that on Earth, your problem is that every ton of rock you move costs you money. Mm -hmm. And so for mm -hmm. mining platinum, a lot of this stuff is very deep. It makes sense to do that robotically. And people are developing these these robots to to work in these kinds of conditions. Because remember, the Marinsky Reef is 10 or 20 centimeters across. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to dig out a two meter hole so that your mm -hmm. your your miner can uh, can go down and, and dig that out? It would be much better to have a 30 centimeter robot that can do all this digging. Um, right. That said, you also need to develop new methods of extracting that stuff because mm -hmm. the method you have is you're extracting platinum from silicate rock to get the platinum okay. out of iron bearing mm -hmm. substrate is a whole different chemical pro uh, problem. I see. It's Maybe really an easier one. It's not present anywhere on Earth that we find platinum elements mixed with iron directly like that. No, because you just don't find iron on the surface of the earth, uh, in the crust of the earth directly. Mm -hmm. There's only right. like three places where that happens, and it's usually one. Um, uh, these are usually small little bits of iron. Mm -hmm. And often from meteorites, right? That have no, um, you know, there. What happens is that uh, it's it's really funky volcanic terrain. Mm -hmm. Like uh -huh. when a volcano erupts through a big, thick coal bed. 
mm. and you get a chemical reduction in the uh, from the reaction between the coal and the uh, and the liquid rock, mm. and that precipitates out uh, the, the metal. Huh. Like a like an iron refining process, but done naturally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, the places you get it are like. The, the the biggest uh, area that you get is in Greenland, for instance. Hmm. Interesting. Um, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, there's a. Did you have a? I was going to ask about iron, Eric, but maybe you wanted to take. No, go go ahead. Yeah. All right. So iron. So, I understand that you're going to have to extract platinum and its related elements from a whole bunch of iron, you know, grams yeah. per ton, right? Right. But iron is pretty useful as a building material on Earth. And so my yeah. leading question is, could we use that iron in space as a construction material, uh, even though it's sort of heavy, you know, uh, more dense, not quite as strong per, per kilogram as something like aluminum? Does it make sense for us to be thinking about using the whole asteroid and uh, use that iron as well? Yeah, absolutely. The things like the gallium and the the platinum would be essentially a, a slag from your mm -hmm. iron refining process. Mm -hmm. So you know a uh, a subsidiary product, and yeah, that would make a huge amount of sense. Yeah, I mean, it, you it, can't sell right. it on Earth, but as a space material for construction of space stations rocket bodies, engines, yeah. you know, surface habitat, habitat structures, you name it. Uh, it sounds like it could be extremely valuable because you don't have to bring it up from Earth and it's absolutely in a deep gravity well. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And it comes in big semi-refined chunks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I hear it can be used directly in some cases. If you've got iron nickel as a, as a mixture, that alloy is already a pretty good um, uh, building material yeah. Okay. And it's not like we don't have a lot of information on this stuff. We have something mm -hmm. like 1300 iron meteorites. <laughs> so we have an extensive yeah. uh, supply of knowledge about the basic structure and yeah. chemistry of these things. Well, that actually gets me to an interesting question. You mentioned we've got a lot of knowledge on the, you know, basic structure and chemistry of asteroids, but, you know, we're not out there mining asteroids yet. And I remember one of your talks, you talked about uh, the, what you called the TRL Valley of Death. Um, I'm yeah. wondering if you could give our listeners a little overview of what a TRL is and then talk to us about the Valley of Death. Well, TRL is NASA speak. And... Uh... If you've ever been in a NASA meeting, you know that it's quite easy for somebody to say an entire sentence and only use like two or three real words. <laughs> TRL is technology readiness levels. Mm -hmm. And it goes from one to nine. Nine being something that's flying in space. Um, one is something scribbled on a soggy uh, bar napkin. And <laughs> You know, it, that's just the way it works. You know, you come up mm -hmm. with an idea after a couple of drinks and scribble it down and show it to the guy next to you. And she says, well, you know, that might work, but it could be physically impossible. You're, you might be violating the laws of physics. And then TRL2 is when you go back, you wake up the next morning, you do a few more calculations and figure out that you haven't violated the laws of physics. So you're at TRL2. Um, then you, you go to your lab and put together a few things and uh, do a proof of concept. And you're at TRL3. Mm -hmm. Your problem then is that to develop the thing between TRL3, where you're pretty sure you can do it, to TRL6, where you're actually putting together stuff that you can test in a relevant environment. And relevant environment is cold, vacuum, high vibration, mm -hmm. things like that. That takes a lot of money. That's millions of dollars for you know, one, one piece of equipment. And that's really, uh, you can quite often get money to do the initial development, 
And you can quite often get money to build an actual instrument that you've proven can function. But getting between those two steps where you know you can do it and you have a piece that can reasonably function in space. That's what's called the TRL Valley of Death. And that's something that, especially for in-situ resource utilization and space commercialization, there's a whole range of technologies that need to be pushed beyond TRL 3 and 4 into the 6 and 7 range. Right. And that's something that um, needs to be done over the next 10 years. Do, do you think, so I'm jumping ahead, maybe you have an answer for how do we bridge this, but the first thing that occurs to me is, you know, any um, uh, common platform, whether it's in Earth orbit or on the lunar surface or hanging around near a near Earth asteroid, you know, that provides a facility for, you know, um, maturing technologies could be very helpful. Do you yep. do you think that the way we're going to do this is once we establish a permanent moon base and we can start to do experiments there like we're doing in the ISS now, or do we need something else um, for ISRU in particular? Well, I think the, the, the real um, catalyst to this is not where you're doing it, but uh, having having the money to do it. Nobody is going to let you on their space station or send you to the moon unless you're already at an advanced TRL. Because you don't want to blow up. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to their blow up day. the space station or uh, or discover that uh, your little machine produces toxic gases. And um, and that's that's an issue with all of these things is that you really have to, you're guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. That's the way it has to be. So what you really need are uh, NASA programs or uh, venture capitalism to provide the money to bridge these gaps. Um, and typically what, has happened in the past is that you've taken technology that's been developed for other areas or other reasons and applied them to this new uh, mm -hmm. to space exploration. So a lot of military technology most recently. Um, but uh, doing that kind of basic development, particularly for things where you're extracting resources from asteroids or the moon, there's a whole range of technologies that you need to do. Because say you want to get oxygen out of a rock. Well, you have to have a power supply that allow you to melt that rock and a system that will allow you to electrolyze it so that the oxygen goes one way and the silicon and the, the metal goes another then you're taking that oxygen out and undoubtedly it's not going to be pure oxygen. It's going to have a bunch of other crap in it that which might be toxic to, to the end users. And you're going to have to be able to take that out. You're going to have mm -hmm. to have a system for storing it. So just in the last 30 seconds, I've talked about five distinct technologies, mm -hmm. all of which need to be advanced beyond the and soggy kind of part of that. Yeah. And they're, and interdependent. they're interlinked. Yeah, yeah they're, they're interdependent. Yeah. I was going to say, and, there's, you can't have a business plan with just, say, the power if there's no customer to use it. So it correct. sort of has to be developed in tandem with the others. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm an, of a historical bent of mind. And one of the reasons why you waited 120 years from the discovery of the Western Hemisphere to the settlement of New England is that the economics and the technology needed to advance to the point where it was a viable business model to ship religious pilgrims one direction and <laughs> dried fish and lumber the, the other direction. And that's what created the North Atlantic economy. Hmm. And, what happened to... during, yeah, and what happened during those, those hundred years was a revolution in shipping technology. 
Uh -huh. You know, we may hmm, think sounds, of it as... We, yeah, we, yeah it, it sounds, sounds a little like familiar. What, right? Yeah, it sounds yeah. a lot like what's happening right now. But <laughs> the revolution in shipping technology was as simple as extensive use of block and tackle. So you could, mm -hmm. you could get rid of most of your crew. As the whole point of a block and tackle is that mm -hmm. you you have mechanical advantage, and so you don't need 20 guys hauling on a rope. You could get by with five. And so you fire the other 15, and that way you can cut your your shipping costs mm -hmm. way down. Hmm. Yeah, like reusable spacecraft could also <laughs> like use reusable those costs. spacecraft. <laughs> yeah, that mm -hmm. are a quarter mm -hmm. as much as, mm -hmm. yeah. as the Cadillac version. Yeah. So, so, all right. So you're saying, yeah, go ahead, Eric. I think we're well, on the same page. You know, it, it, I think that's a really interesting uh, parallel there to, to look at history and, and mention that, uh, you know, a, a big a shift in, in our, you know, you know, Western civilizations move, you know, into the, uh, you know, the Americas had to do with economies, right, yeah. and technology. Um, I recall from one of your talks, you you mentioned that the age of exploration was also the age of piracy, and I'm wondering how you know how that might factor in as we as we move off the planet. Uh, it, will be, that, yeah. it will be interesting and fun. <laughs> it will be interesting. <laughs> um, I'm sure it was fun to be a pirate. I'm not sure it was fun to well, record it. Now, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the real issue is is a problem of jurisdiction and terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so back when they first created the legal structure for the New World, basically the Pope drew a, a line of longitude and said everything east is Portuguese, everything west is Spanish. And of course, how well did that work out? Not great. Not great. But the thing is that people, you know, that's that's the reason Brazil speaks Portuguese mm -hmm. today. Right, right. But um, you know, the point is that um, the Spanish had this real problem because, you know, you talk about them hunting the seven cities of gold and think, mm -hmm. oh, how ridiculous. Why should you wander around the American Southwest looking for cities of gold? But they had found a bunch already. They had gone to, they had gone to central mm -hmm. Mexico, found a city of gold. Mm -hmm. They'd gone to, um, to Peru, found another city of gold. A logical thing would be that, well, you know, there's been a few already. Let's find some more. Mm -hmm. Quite reasonable. Um, but what had happened was that they were essentially developing a whole bunch. Their export was based on extraction technologies, gold mm -hmm. and silver. And they tripled the precious metal supply of the of the world in a hundred years because mm -hmm. there was so much. Mm -hmm. So and that could easily happen with space resources. I guess people have even talked about tanking the world platinum market if you bring back yeah. enough of it from one. Well, asteroid, you know, right? again, there are lots of technologies that you have to develop. But yeah. um, from the piracy point of view, you're running high valued cargoes long distances through areas mm -hmm. where you have poor institutional control. Right. So go figure. Yeah, of course, there's going to be piracy. Yeah. And piracy is 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 a point of view of of of, um, of uh, uh, jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. Francis Drake circumnavigated the world, big hero in Anglo-Saxon culture. If you talk to somebody from Hispanic culture, he's the lowest form of scum and criminal because what he, he made his name essentially robbing from the Spanish his jurisdiction he was partners with Queen Elizabeth so Queen Elizabeth uh, invested in his little venture and reaped profit from the stuff he stole from the Spanish so from the from the English jurisdiction hmm. He's an explorer from the Spanish jurisdiction. He's a criminal. And you're going to end up in space where what might be okay in an American jurisdiction would be looked upon as piracy from mm -hmm. a Chinese jurisdiction. And it, yeah. you're only a pirate if somebody from the other jurisdiction catches you and imposes their jurisdiction and their laws on you, mm -hmm. which the Spanish did plenty to a lot of unfortunate 
Englishmen, and Englishmen did it to a lot of unfortunate Spanish. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's ahead. my view. It's my view. I mean, of course, I maybe lean a little too much on the optimistic side sometimes, but it is my view that, um, you know, national governments, first of all, space is large, and there are plenty of good places to get resources from. And if, you know, country A or company A is mining a platinum rich asteroid over here, there are probably 10 or 20 more that you can get to with similarly low, you know, energy uh, um, investments, Delta V, you know, to do uh, a similar kind of mining. There might be, there might be cases where there's one really good one that everyone wants to get to, but then that tends to be a fairly large object as well. And maybe there's a way to, to share the spoils with appropriate diplomacy. But I, I don't know. I, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we would prefer to have some kind of a rule of law where there's enough for everyone to go around, especially at the beginning. And, you know, we can all sort of have a have a, uh, a piece of the action. Yeah. Um, well, there's a whole field of natural resources economics and mm -hmm. and development economics where the key factor is institutional frameworks and rule of law being able to define who has property rights and respect and enforce those. And that makes a huge difference in your investment environment, in how you can generate capital, how you can reliably uh, reap the rewards of your investment. You know, that said, um, finding a decent metal rich asteroid is not trivial. Mm -hmm. And there are ways of doing it, and, and people are developing good ways of doing this. But once one person finds, starts mining something, and it's still relatively accessible, there's a big incentive to go and join in, yeah. because your risk has, has largely evaporated then. Because now you know what the ore uh, quality is. Yeah. Now yeah. you know what the ore quality is. It's been proven. And so yeah. you're not you're not re relying on on uh, crackpot bearded scientists who may or may not be crazy, and <laughs> you know if they're wrong, they just go back to their tenured job at a university. <laughs> right. Well, so do you see the um, do you see the international law um, developing in that direction, or are you concerned? Like I know that there have been well, the U.S. has has passed their own legal framework. Luxembourg yeah. has done something similar that has essentially said that we have a right to extract whatever resources from space that exists, but the whole world hasn't agreed to that. We still have this outer space treaty that's kind of in opposition sure. to that in some way. You want, yeah. What, what's your view on where things are well, heading? Well, I will say that I'm not an expert in any of this because I don't track it closely. Mm -hmm. The problem is that law tends to, tends to react to, to conditions and situations. So my example here is the whole idea of freedom of the seas, mm -hmm. freedom of innocent passage. In the start of the age of exploration, nobody believed that. You could get, the Spanish would hang you simply for being in the Caribbean without their permission. Wow. No freedom of, this whole freedom of the seas thing was an invention by the Dutch and the English because they were being excluded from the new world in the Far East. By, by the powers that were there already. And they said, oh, well, you know, right of innocent passage. Well, yeah, now it's enshrined. Mm -hmm. I would expect a similar development, a uh, similar rocky development um, in the legal field. Um, and actually not all countries have signed on to this right of innocent passage stuff. You know, mm -hmm. talk to the Chinese about the South China Sea and the Taiwan right. Strait. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. It's going to be <laughs> interesting, as I said. Yeah. I, I mean, as a as a company speaking on behalf of Orbital Assembly Corp, you know, we we will we will do better if we have stable laws that we can rely on. That if we're yeah. investing billions of dollars in space infrastructure, that it's not going to be taken away from us from another actor without recourse right so we have a strong incentive to make sure those laws are in place all of our all of our peers 
are going to be asking for more or less the same thing. Yeah. Um, it would make a whole lot of sense for everybody to agree on the rules of the road because yeah. a rule-based system produces positive extra external effects all across the board. Um, but one of the, you know, but there are issues where you're going to clash. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, on the moon, there's going to be an issue with, with ejecta from landings and takeoffs because these things will produce uh, hypervelocity uh, uh, ejecta that will go bang into other spacecraft. Yeah, it's a little and, bit like orbital debris today. Yeah, well, a little bit like orbital debris, but the problem is that at 20 kilometers a second, a piece of dust carries the same kinetic energy as a, as a, a pistol bullet, mm -hmm. right? That would be bad. Yeah. And you do that to somebody else's sovereign stuff, um, they might they might get upset. So yeah. they do that to you, you might get upset also. So mm -hmm. there are rules that need to be established. What about um, um, rules around, uh, I guess it wouldn't be a national, but a, a solar system wide heritage sites, you know, hmm. do you think that kind of will factor into the economy? What about, you know, creating a settlement around Ceres or, you know, mining, you know, mining the moon and changing the way it looks from Earth? Have you thought about that kind of impact? Well, that's way past my lifetime. <laughs> so I will defer to future generations on how to work oh, that out. But you're not but gonna, remember well. that, you know, remember that your eyes are not all that sensitive. It would be mm -hmm. really tough. You would have to you'd have to mine and alter a big chunk of the of surface, okay. you know, square kilometers before you yeah. pick yeah. this up. Uh, I mean, we can do that. Series. We can proceed. Yeah. Mining series. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but all of these things require a great deal of effort and technologies yeah. that haven't been developed. So I think I mean, that people would worry about that sometime in the future. Yeah. I mean, just for context, so Ceres, you know, the largest dwarf planet in the asteroid belt is not visible as far as I know uh, with the unaided eye. And so it's a very different case than the moon. Mm -hmm. But as oh, yeah. we start to think about, you know, as we start to alter a lot of solar system objects, as we sort of move out into the solar system, I guess this issue could become a concern. On the other hand, Ceres has an awful lot of water in it, as I understand yeah. it. So it's kind of a prized possession if you're looking for all, you know, water in one place, right? For fuel yep. and so on. And I think that's more of the low hanging fruit in near earth orbit is mm -hmm. water rich asteroids. Right, because yeah. you have have some asteroids where you've got water essentially locked in the crystal structure of the minerals that make up this this asteroid. Uh, uh, NASA and the Japanese space agency JAXA have just done each a rendezvous mission with asteroids that are that are water rich, mm -hmm. and uh, those I think will be prime candidates for mining. Yeah. Do, do you think that the way they will be mined uh, is to directly use the uh, the water for propellant, like by the operation itself, or that it will, for the most part, be mined and returned to another location, say for use in lunar orbit or, you know, Earth orbit? Well, I think the the uh, likely scenario is that you'll mine this, use some of that propellant to bring back the rest of it right. and create a, a market for that propellant. At much lower cost, because of course you're beating the rocket equation somewhat by getting right. half of your propellant from the, the place that you're going to. Yeah, the, yeah. The, this is the old gear ratio problem that mm -hmm. you need 200 kilos of spacecraft and fuel to get one kilo of stuff off of, off of the yeah. earth. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to do that, that's a huge advantage. Right. So that seems quite likely. And the reason why water is such an important resource right now. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of people that are developing thrusters that will run on water. Mm -hmm. Right. Not mm -hmm. as efficiently as when you break it into hydrogen mm -hmm. and oxygen, but. Sure. 
That's it's my yeah, favorite so solution. Yeah, when you just superheat the water and use the steam as as your propellant, so you can have your steam powered rockets and very uh, yeah. <laughs> Steam, steam you know, powered spaceships, yeah. Built with iron. That's that's what you gotta <laughs> add to the picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions from the chat, not many. So if folks are listening yeah. uh, and they want to add, now would be the time. Um, I think you brought up the question about series, uh, Eric. Yeah, but um, I, I thought Aiden had a great question earlier. We were talking about you being a scientist, and he was wondering what your favorite research project was and why. Oh, um, it was something I dreamed up in uh, graduate school because I was lucky enough to have a fellowship to the Smithsonian National Meteorite Collection one summer. And so I learned meteorites by actually looking at several thousand meteorites. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that some didn't look like others that were supposedly the, exactly the same mineralogy. And they were the same mineralogy. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, some were shocked. Uh, with ordinary chondrites, you can turn them black with shock. And so shock my favorite- Shock from an impact? Yes, yeah, shock from an impact. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. overpressures. Mm -hmm. um, the details are, are, are uh, are not necessary to know, but uh, the point is it's fairly easy to identify them. You just, you have a, a shade chart and you can determine the albedo just by looking at it. So I got myself a project to go visit meteorite collections and uh, identify black chondrites. They're called black chondrites. Mm -hmm. And so I got to vi visit lots of meteorite collections. And meteorite collections are generally in pretty nice places. <laughs> they tend to be in the capitals of um, of uh, continent spanning countries or mm. former empires. So I went to Paris, <laughs> and London, and Vienna, mm -hmm. and Moscow. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a pretty <laughs> yeah. sounds like yeah. a pretty good uh, set of, uh, uh, of of travel for you in the name. Yeah, of that was nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's really fun. We have another question um, about the enforceability of these space laws. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, we can work on property rights and, and a law that, you know, everybody agrees upon. But, you know, enforceability is a, a very important part of that. Um, you know, what what ways might we be able to enforce, you know, these rules of the sea or rules of the space, um, you know, and you know, ideally preventing the use of uh, of space weapons, or without the use of. That's a tough one, and I I have to say that I just don't know how this is going mm -hmm. to work out, because you're you're talking about jurisdictions with vastly different attitudes toward their legal system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. there's. There's this reverence for rule of law in in the United States, but that's not shared universally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, but like I said earlier, it's you know it is in a, a U.S. company's or a European company's best interest to have this strongly in place. So I I feel like the uh, the diplomats have their hands full trying to negotiate something that can be enforceable across the the, the big national players. If we're going to have a space industry, so yeah, and I think that's, around it. that's real. That's that's key. Institutional frameworks are key to development, and that's been shown over and over again in 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 economic research. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, we'll be uh, interviewing a space lawyer who thinks about this full time fairly soon. Don't have anyone uh, invited yet, but we'll be we'll be making Okay, it. well that'll be interesting. Yeah. I'll have to I'll have yeah. to, to to look yeah. into that. And so I think we're getting comments. Yeah, getting close to the end of time here, but um, I do want to ask you have mentioned that in the past it seemed that, you know, that space is always 30 to 40 years away. And I'm wondering yeah. if you think that's changed recently or if there's something that we as a as a space community or the general population can do to to change that. Well, Elon Musk, I think, has done the most mm -hmm. to change that. 
right now because mm -hmm. essentially he's revolutionized the whole launch cost mm -hmm. issue. And dropping launch costs are key to getting anywhere. And once you For can sure. get to low Earth orbit or to, to lunar space reliably and cheaply, then a whole range of potential ores open up. Because remember, this is not a mm -hmm. technology issue. It's an economic one. Yeah. And so it's really costs and transportation costs that are first. But what happens, again, I'll, I'll throw in a few historical uh, framework uh, thoughts. One of the things that the Spanish found was that in their shipping technology, they were actually at, the, at really the, 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 the bleeding edge of how far they could drive their galleons mm -hmm. and not kill their crews. <laughs> so they had just enough food and just enough water. So the very first thing they started to do was establish advanced bases where they were growing food and, um, and, um, and creating the conditions where you can extend your, your reach in the Caribbean by resupplying. Mm -hmm. And also they would leave more crew there so that they could uh, replace lost crew members. Um, and it's establishing advanced bases that were key. And every exploring country did that. Hmm. You know, with uh, the Spanish, it eventually became Havana was their advanced base. And the thing is that when they conquered um, uh, Mexico, the expedition to conquer Mexico was not, was not raised out of Spain. It was raised out of Cuba. And they didn't even ask hmm. the authorities back in Spain in Spain, if it was a good idea or not, they just went and did it with the resources they had available huh. and presented yeah, the Spanish up, crown with a fait accompli. Yeah. I was going to say that brings up an issue, a whole other topic we won't get into, but you know, with the limitations of communication in the mm -hmm. era you're talking about might've been one of the reasons why they didn't ask permission because it would take too long to get an answer. Sure. We could be looking at similar kinds of problems with, time delay communications mm -hmm. or sending things well, in a, you know, people yeah. to different parts of the solar system. Well, and also even if there's time to the, the time delay, light time delay is not too bad, but remember that um, people who are on the spot um, can do things. And if you want right. to be on the spot in some place like lunar space mm -hmm. or Martian space or asteroid space, it's, weeks or months or even years to get there yeah how right. are you going to stop them right right you're going to say oh don't do that i'll be really mad <laughs> well <laughs> yeah good luck with that yeah i guess that gets back to the enforceability huh? yeah right uh, we had one time for one more question um uh, we had a question uh, how rare is 16 psyche among the asteroids uh, which was presented as a very rich resource well, it's probably a one of these stripped cores mm -hmm. from a differentiated asteroid. And it's actually not all that rare. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of metal rich asteroids. Um, mm -hmm. The issue really is how much metal is there. Some people say you know, it's not really that metal rich. Some people say it's very metal rich. I fall down on the very metal rich end. Mm -hmm. But it's so we understand that as as an iron rich asteroid, it's not that rare, but it is rare in terms of its size, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's one the of biggest the largest, one. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But that but just I means that you had something the size of Vesta, where you ripped off the crust and mantle, mm -hmm. you shattered the uh, the core, and then reassembled most of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So is Psyche of interest because it is easy to get to or because we just know that it's there and, you know, we, we have a pretty good idea of its composition? Uh, I think it's of interest because it's it's the core of a differentiated planetesimal mm -hmm. or a differentiated dwarf planet. And if you can imagine a planet that essentially has been smashed apart and it allows you to explore 
mm -hmm. uh, regions in geology space that would be are completely inaccessible. How are you going to get to the core of this planet? Right. Mm -hmm. No way. No way. With today's technology. <laughs> well, I, tell us how to do that a couple hundred years. Ago? Jules Verne. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I would want to develop that kind of technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or beyond his ship, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, they, you know, it's and 16 psyche will be very interesting. Uh, the, the problems that you deal with for the surface processes on that will be applicable to this yeah. whole range of metal rich mm. things. Because imagine, you know, you've got a iron surface being micro bombarded by micrometeorites for the age of the solar system. What does that look like? What does a metal rich yeah. regolith mm -hmm. look like? It would be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. A lot of fun and it's, interesting things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sure. I. I was, we were about to wrap up. I just thought, uh, Eric, I would ask Dan if there's anything else that you wanted to mention from, you know, kind of this general topic. Is there something we missed that you might want to leave our readers with? Or Well, I'll it? throw out an advertisement. Uh, mm -hmm. One of, one of uh, the Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Sciences objects is to support the exploration community not only with scientific knowledge, but we make simulants for mm -hmm. essentially all exploration targets. So we make lunar, asteroid, and, and Martian simulants. Mm -hmm. And if you want, you can look up Exolith on the internet, and we take credit cards. And we'll ship you <laughs> kilos or tons wow. of simulant, depending on what you want. Which and is a we big also deal, because... You can't get provide, a lot of that from an asteroid. <laughs> no, yeah, well, yeah. There's lots of there's a lot, you know, meteorites fall out of the sky all the time. It's just that they are scarce and expensive. Yeah. Right. It gives us a chance to understand the mineralogy. That's how we make the simulants. Excellent. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for your time. Uh, we really wanted to get into kind of some of the science of uh, solar system resources, and I think we've we've dug a little deeper in in our interview with you. Mm -hmm. We'll be uh, continuing this conversation on occasion with other experts as we keep exploring this question of how we will build a spacefaring civilization using the resources of space. Um, but uh, we really appreciate your your knowledge and your thoughtfulness, particularly the economic perspective and rule of law. So we've got a lot to think about. Eric, anything you want to? Leave, leave. Oh, just yeah. Thank you for coming, and I guess I'd like to thank uh, everybody who joined our live recording here and, and asked questions. We got to get get a, get through a couple of those, and um, and for our listeners out there, you know, if you have uh, any suggestions for future discussion topics, uh, people you'd want to interview, or if you just want to get on the list to uh, come to the to the live session uh, during recording, uh, just let us know. Uh, you can email us at ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com. You can find us on Twitter at Our Future Space and Facebook at Our Future in Space. So uh, thank you, Dan and, and, and Jeff and everybody who's listening. Uh, I think we had a really great conversation today. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thank thank you. Great for us as well. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. All right. Bye. <laughs>